Yes. Okay. So, um, so here we are. We are back. Um, and uh, and I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Ina Liking and Professor Alstasa Gorodzewski um, that uh, are going to share uh, with us um, a talk about working across disciplines. Uh, between social studies of knowledge and uh, quantitative comparative sociology. Um, and um, I just want to say that uh, it is a very interesting uh, combination of a person trained as an anthropologist and a, a, a person trained as a sociologist, that these are generally disciplines that, that co co they, they, have, they are cohabiting the same department and yet <laughs> make the point in distinguishing themselves from each other. So we have kind of here of, of very, very <laughs> interesting pluralism. <laughs> uh, and the, the speaker is a sociologist. Uh, so I, I absolutely understand uh, uh, that there is nothing to be taken for granted in this, uh, in this collaboration. Um, uh, both of you now are affiliated with the Department of, of Sociology at the Open University, INA, and Tel Aviv University for Anastasia, and uh, working in uh, issues of, of uh, migrations and borders. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for sharing uh, today uh, your work. Uh, and uh, Anastasia and Ina, the, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Paula, for the uh, presentation, and thank you, Paula and uh, Maya, for, invita for inviting us. Um, yes, um, working across disciplines, I would add to the introduction, the uh, nice introduction of Paula, that I'm not only sociologist, I'm quantitative sociologist, yeah, from uh, a train <laughs> as a quantitative sociologist, so an image anthropologist, so let's add to the distance for, for now being. And then um, we will try to uh, present uh, our uh, collaborative work as a journey. And uh, we'll talk about different uh, stage pitfalls and benefits of such collaborative work. Um, we'll try to touch three issues. We'll try to answer the question uh, like shortly. Yeah? How do we work together? How do we write together? And how do we deal with the reaction to our work? But before we need, to, even if briefly, to present our research project and then to talk about our approach to interdisciplinarity. So we will allow us to begin with the animated and very brief uh, version of the research that has been the initial step of this uh, journey. And I uh, hope it will work. Um, if it has sound, perhaps you can turn on your sound. You have to mark on turning on uh, the sound of your computer before sharing. Okay, before just you do the sharing. You okay, have, yes, you yes. Share computer sound. Yes, and, yeah, and, yeah, I did it. Great, I okay. hope, okay. Thanks. Uh, sorry for this. In 2010, Estonia and Latvia were classed among the poorest countries in the European Union. Oops. I have no idea what's going on here. In 2010, Estonia and Latvia were classed among the poorest countries in the European Union, but also with the largest share of international migrants. Usually, people migrate to richer countries, looking for economic opportunities. So what's behind the statistical riddle? Researchers from Tel Aviv University and the Open University of Israel believe their study into how migration status is classified provides an important clue. They looked at the population statistics and noticed that leading international institutions define international migrants as persons born abroad based on present-day state borders. According to these sources, in 2010, 16% and 15% of the national populations of Estonia and Latvia were classified as international migrants. However, until dissolution in 1991, these states were part of the former Soviet Union. The researchers recalculated. Only about a tenth of these international migrants had actually crossed international borders at the time of their migration. The rest had not crossed international borders. 
The international borders were moved around them. Inaccurate classification can distort population parameters and have lasting consequences for people's life chances and opportunities. For example, it may legitimize their discrimination and social exclusion. The moral behind the riddle? Statistical categories of international migrants can hide historical processes of state formation. Appearing politically neutral, these categories privilege ethno-national definitions of the states in its current borders. Okay, so um, in this research, actually using the, the perspective from our two uh, uh, disciplinaries, yeah, we, 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 we try we found that the uh, seemingly natural statistical categories of international migrant ignores historical processes of state formation. And this work, the initial work, became a step, a stepping stone for developing a larger uh, collaborative research project that now examines uh, the social meaning of migration-related measures forged in Western context, but assumed to have transferable and universal character in the context of relatively new post-socialist European states. And with this uh, larger uh, project, we uh, try to examine two statistical categories, both of which are basic units of analysis in migration studies, international migrant and non-citizens, and two sociological concepts popularly imagined as intervened and sometimes almost inseparable, anti-immigrant sentiments and right-wing political orientation. Uh, the issue, the question of transferability or commensurability of these uh, categories and this concept is um, especially relevant for the countries with the recent changes in their sovereign borders. And this recent change in the country borders actually happened to overwhelming majority of post-socialist European countries, as you could see here, in 90 out of 24 countries in post-socialist Europe, borders changed after 1989. So this is about the project for now. We, uh, succeeded to publish a couple of articles out of it, one that done uh, one that reconstruct the category of international migrant and another one that actually discuss the issue of West East methodological bias in measuring international migration. And now I will just pass the microphone to Ina to talk about our interdisciplinary approach. So we are going to the methods and paradigms and the reason for this meeting. Great. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so, so um, rather than talking about mixing methods or mixed methods, uh, we decided to talk about interdisciplinarity. And um, so our study is interdisciplinary by nature, as it shows from our, uh, um, uh, <clears throat> our professional backgrounds. And the study brings together theoretical insights from the scholarship on the politics of social knowledge and from the sociological research on migra migration, and it builds on the analytical and methodological tools of both the qualitative study of uh, knowledge practices and the quantitative uh, comparative approach. Now, I want to say a few words about interdisciplinarity, which uh, it's a topic that, that interests us um, theoretically and epistemologically. Um, I, I guess Pat talked a bit about it in the beginning of the, of the conference, but um, um, I think it's important to sort of spell out how we think about interdisciplinarity. And so it is a very compelling idea, uh, crossing disciplinary boundaries is a very comp uh, compelling idea, which um, fails uh, more often that, than, than succeeds. Uh, but, but nevertheless, it has recently become one of the ruling paradigms in academia. And we all know that uh, 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 funding agencies um, love this idea very much. Um, but the idea of interdisciplinarity can imply different sets of values. So the first one, the first sort of on the one hand or the first set of value of values is that there is a practical sense of addressing issues that cannot be understood or solved by just one approach. Um, without going into the sort of neoliberal origins of this of this model, 
this form of collaboration resembles what Marilyn Strathern calls a management model of knowledge creation. It involves several independent experts, disciplinary experts addressing sort of responsible for a specific chunk of research that then can be easily turned into a digestible information and can be distributed usually to inform uh, policies. Um, also called interdisciplinary, effectively, this approach um, does not involve crossing disciplinary boundaries and uh, research, research tools are more of a sort of tools of management. On the other hand, there is another more powerful model of interdisciplinary engagement. And um, that's model that we sort of try to, to um, work with. And this model encourages debate as a point of growth uh, and the debate um, um, involves uh, critically engaging with each other's disciplinary concerns, ideas, um, and um, and uh, and uh, problems. Uh, so, so basically, it's it's an engagement by virtue of uh, disagreement, uh, engagement by virtue of criticism. Um, the management model. The differences between the two models is that the management model establishes the goals of knowledge creation in advance, um, usually to inform uh, policies, and that's why it is often used in applied sciences. And the second model, the, the one that we are working with, um, it doesn't set any sort of ideal singular outcome. It rather encourages debate as a point of growth. So basically our way of working with each other, which, with each other is by, um, by disagreement. It's our main practice is a practice of disagreement. Um, and we understand that the epistemological, theoretical, methodological differences between the social studies of knowledge and quantitative comparative sociology are vast, but these differences have the potential to produce a productive mutual exchange. Now, comparative quantitative sociology is grounded in this assumption that comparison um, does not only reveal differences between countries, societies, cultures, but it also uncovers aspects of a society that would be difficult to detect without a broader comparison. The social study of knowledge is fundamentally concerned with the social nature and the political power of categories used in this comparative research. And our interdisciplinary project forces us to engage with both these disciplinary conventions. We explore the contested context of the production application of, of the categories, as we showed with the, with the category of international migrant, for example, in, um, in, in the post-Soviet Baltic states. But we do that without rejecting the categorization and quantification necessary for comparative research. We rather seek to reflexively understand the uses and misuses of the categories, as well as the agencies and social and political context, uh, context that shaped them. Uh, as uh, Paolo already mentioned, we come from two very different uh, epistemological traditions. Although it's interesting because we were both socialized into the social sciences in the same department. We both did our MAs in Tel Aviv University in the Department of Sociology and Anthropology. But like Paul said, you know, two very, um, uh, two neighboring disciplines work hard to sort of distinguish um, um, their identities uh, from, from the other. Um, my main tool of work, of, of research is ethnography. I'm an anthropologist by training. I'm, I'm a political anthropologist interested in knowledge, interested in, in post-socialist change. Anastasia is a quantitative sociologist. Her main methodological tool is statistical models. And uh, talking across these different epistemological traditions involves a lot of sort of uh, checks and balances. And we will talk about these checks and balances uh, now, um, so in, in here we want to reflect on this three point that Anastasia mentioned, we want to say something about how we work together in sort of broader terms, and then I'll continue to talk about how we write together and how, how we handle the reactions to our work from our respective audiences. Uh, okay, so a, a couple of uh, words about how we work together. Um, I think 
two main questions that uh, this collaborative uh, work uh, forced us to deal with. And uh, I would say this is a title that we go in with uh, to every meeting is uh, how do we see each other's paradigm and what to do with an ego? Uh, because uh, to be able to work together, we, we have, first of all, to acknowledge uh, the limit of our knowledge and to acknowledge it loudly and to acknowledge it in every session and every meeting. So um, the limit of our knowledge is uh, cons are constrained, the limits of our knowledge are constrained uh, by our disciplinary expertise. But uh, moreover, uh, our knowledge and our understanding of others' paradigm, of others' epistemological tradition is also limited by our experience and by our own epistemological paradigms. And as in method classes, when we teach, and how we were taught in method classes, yeah, when we teach a uh, research paradigm, research tradition, we often uh, define our tradition um, or paradigm in contrast to others, as in life. Yeah, also in research, we often define us in contrast to others. And these definitions in contrast to others, in relations to others, although sometimes necessary, we believe they at the end create kind of reductive understanding of each other paradigms. We do not know and we cannot know the nuances of others paradigm and how this other paradigm um, deal with the problems. Uh, we, we do not know the nuances of inside criticism within this other paradigm and what is indeed considered good, high quality, careful research in this other paradigm. So we need to be asking questions and we need to be listening and listening carefully. And this is what we try to do. It's not easy, but this is, uh, this is an attempt that we, uh, that we are making. On the other side of the same coin, is how we handle each other questions. What we do when the question about one's paradigm coming from point of view of another paradigm. How we do not dismiss this question. How we do not think that this question comes to undermine authority of mind paradigm of, of inner paradigm. Yeah, how we can, uh, answer this question that coming from the other paradigm, from the eyes of the other paradigm, how we can answer this question sincerely and carefully, and how this answer actually requires us to reflect on our own research tradition, on our own way to make a research. Um, because if we try to give this answer uh, sincerely to the extent that we can do it, it may help us to reflect on our own research. It make, it make us check in and in, 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 in justifying each step in our research, the logic of our methods, and maybe even avoiding mistake. I will try to make some specific example about it. Um, we were building our argument and point about the persistence of uh, international migrant statistical categories in a, a despite its flaws and insensitivity. And we built this point based on textual report written by different statistical experts. And um, I kept asking Ina textual reports do we really have enough invalid evidence that prove our point? I mean, is it enough? When we, do we know that we have enough evidence to prove point? You can realize I'm coming from quantitative uh, comparative sociologists. I need big data sets. I mean, I need robustness tests. I need, I do not know, models, yeah? How, is it really enough? So 
at the end, the answer of this question of this for this kind of question required to spelling out what constitutes enough and valid evidence in each discipline. Yeah, it um, and once we answer this kind of question from different discipline, I believe we may it may lead us to more careful applying of our of the principle of our own research tradition. So at the end, I guess one of the uh, uh, conclusion we made from this work together in terms of how to work together, or maybe it's one of the point of reflection, is actually the high quality and careful research based on rich empirical data under post-positivist or constructivist paradigms have much more in common than poor quality research under this paradigm. So there's a lot of concern that we are not aware that the other paradigm actually taken care of. But uh, with the limits of our knowledge about this paradigm, we may not know about this concern. And then we need to debate. Yeah, and then we need to talk. So I will uh, now uh, pass it back to Ina to the question of writing together. Yeah, so, so now into the pragmatics, right? So, <laughs> uh, uh, so how do we actually do that? So we started, uh, it's, it's, it's simple. So we started as uh, many people do, we would divide the tasks and then try to sort of write uh, um, separate chunks of the, of the articles by ourselves and then, um, ask uh, um, um, for comments from, from, from the co-author. So, um, and then we would correct the drafts and then send it back and forth. And what we ended up realizing is that, that we were basically um, undoing each other's work um, every time, every draft would go sort of um, two steps back instead of uh, one step forward. And that led us to rethink our approach to writing and working together. And we actually, um, uh, we began to write together. So to very heavy parts of the, of the papers we write together in the same room or over Zoom <laughs> as it were. Um, and that, that allows us to sort of disagree and agree conceptually and to resolve misunderstanding, miscommunications. Um, and that that's the that's the process of disagreement that I was talking about in the inter in the interdisciplinary model that we are abide by. The, the, the process of writing itself allows us to engage these different ideas and conventions and to sort of rethink our own, reflectively think about our own conventions that what Anastasia was talking about in the in the process of working together. Uh, and we never know in advance when the disagreement would appear, where, 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 when the need for debate um, emerges. We never know that. That's that's another point of this interdisciplinary model, right? So we don't have an, an a sort of a, a, a pre a pre uh, presumed um, and assumed uh, outcome of our of of, of our research process. Um, so only when we actually write together, we realize that there is a need for a debate. There is a need for a serious uh, and deep clarification of, of the meanings of what we are trying to do. And um, I know that um, the sort of the pragmatics of writing together might uh, look, or they might seem sort of quite similar to writing with the, just a co-author from your own discipline. But I think the, the, the nature of, of, of what, what it means to compromise in this particular setting, writing setting, is quite different uh, than when you work with someone from the same discipline. And that goes to the different sort of um, registers, different levels. It's, uh, it goes to the level of language, of just the professional language and how you write, disciplinary conventions, of course, and uh, um, also how you write to different audiences or how how do you accommodate two sets of audiences in in one paper um it also in our case it's always a debate about the order of things or when do you uh how, what is the order of 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 your um 
uh, findings or what the introduction should include. Um, um, should it include the, the main finding or sort of the main sort of argument and then you explain how you got there or should you tell first how you got there and then sort of explain the argument? Um, and we, we, we always talk about that and we try to, um, um, and of course it sometimes depends on what journal you're trying to send it to, but, but still it's, it's, more than a, than, it's more than a practical issue. I think there's a lot of epistemological issues that are coming up with that. Um, and, and then the example of how we triangulate textual, uh, textual evidence with quantitative data, that's what uh, Anastasia was talking about. And, and the, just the language is just a funny example of language, right? So Anastasia uh, prohibits me from using uh, the word significance in, uh, in when I write, because in, in, the, in the quantitative uh, sociology sort of, when they talk about significance, they talk about statistical significance, right? And, and here am I in, um, trying to say something significant about, uh, um, you know, um, ethnographic or qualitative finding or the social, the significance of the social meaning, something like that. So that's always a question. And, um, um, and the question of audience, of course, I already said that. So on the one hand, um, you don't want to write sort of, um, you, don't, you don't want to um, say something that would look trivial uh, to your audience, but also you want to be trivial in order to be clear or uh, transparent to the other's audience. That's a sort of a, um, a game that we always need to play. And um, just to give an example of that, um, uh, of the processes and, and also to answer the question of how we handle the reactions to our work from, from different audiences. Um, I, I'll give an example of one of the reviews that we've got uh, recently from a reviewer that was a reviewer number one, not number two, luckily. So the reviewer number one asked us to clarify uh, the register, the epistemological register of our analysis, or sort of what is your epistemology, where where, where do you stand? And um, I, um, that was the paper in which we focused on the contextualization of the definition of international migrant, how the category of international migrant um, is not easily translated across different geopolitical contexts, and um, and at first we were very mad at this, at this reviewer. Sort of, what kind of question is that? What? Why would we need to explain to you what our epistemological register is? Of course, we you know we know what we're talking about. And then we actually realized that she uh, she did us a great favor uh, for asking to clarify for, for our own sake. Um, um, our sort of uh, uh, our epistemological or the epistemological di dimension of our of our analysis, and uh, so what we said is that you know we let's assume that the international migrant category is socially constructed, and it is socially constructed, and we truly believe that it's socially constructed. And that's the the one socially constructed. It is an assumed and accepted truth, right? So that's that's the reality. That's the the. the the international migrant category is a socially constructed reality. But uh, if it is socially constructed, it, it should be socially constructed um, for everyone everywhere. So people with similar migrant experiences are, suppo are supposed to fall under this same category in all the countries, if we want to talk um, about it in comparative terms. So that and the question is, how is that in some countries, people who haven't crossed international borders at the time of their migration are called international migrants? Um, and, and that definition, it's not simply a, a mistake or sort of a, a failure to account for uh, or, or specific group, group of people. This definition has uh, tangible social and political consequences for people who are called international migrants or who are not called international migrants. So what we're trying to say is that, listen, our register is not purely constructivist or purely positivist, right? What we aim to do is we want to reflectively understand the workings of the category without dismissing their usefulness. 
dismissing their usefulness is pointless, right? Because that would mean dismissing, I don't know, the whole modern apparatus of governing in the world, which is based on uh, categorization and quantification. So rather than just um, um, criticizing for the sake of criticizing, we want to say something, um, something more complex or um, at least uh, um, um, more um, um, sociologically uh, um, uh, sociologically complex than than just saying that you know they're not th those are not good categories. Right? Let's let's dismiss them. Yeah, so that was the, the example of how we handle and how actually sort of questions from uh, from reviewers from different disciplines help us clarify our own our our epistemological um, mm -hmm. register, as it were. Yeah. Ina Anastasia, I would like uh, to leave some minutes for questions. Yeah, we're done. Answers. We're done. Paul. We're oh. done. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Great. So thank you very much. Just in time. Just in time. Thank you very much. Um, I enjoyed very much your talk, and I really, really appreciate your your sincerity and your your you know your keen uh, sharing about the <clears throat> both the theoretical but also the practical aspects of of working together and uh, crossing the streets of of each one of the disciplines and the methodologies. So it was very, uh, very, a very refreshing uh, breathe of uh, breathe of air. Thank you very much. Um, there is a question about uh, for from uh, Yehezkel. Uh, Yehezkel, would you like to open your mic and and ask the question by yourself? I think uh, maybe you ask it. Okay, so I, I will read the I will read the, the, the question. Yeheskel asks uh, if you can provide a concrete example of fine of a finding of a finding you wouldn't have Hello, arrived can, to. Can you can you? Oh, hear perfect! Me? Yeah, thank uh, you very yeah, much. I, I was I was trialing a bit to find the <laughs> unmute. Okay, great. No, I thank was you. curious to to hear a, a concrete example about your specific research on the migration in the Baltics of a finding that you wouldn't have arrived unless you combined quantitative and qualitative methodology, something what was the, the added value that uh, you know, allowed you to, to reach to, to a specific insight. Thanks. Okay, uh, yeah, I, uh, I just shared the graph, just uh, I think it's with the answer because I also uh, read the question quickly. So let's say um, the, we, we need the knowledge, yeah, we need, um, we need the expertise from this uh, knowledge about uh, socially constructed categories and, uh, and uh, uh, to understand what's going on with these categories and why people who are called international migrants are, uh, and why people who didn't migrate, yeah, who didn't migrate internationally, for example, called international migrants. Okay, we can talk about it as a, as an anecdote yeah and say okay we know that this happened but we need we, we do not know, using uh, uh, and then we can uh, uh, discuss the, the the construction of the category but before discussing the construction of the category we do need statistics and we do need comparative approach to see to what extent it happens yeah to what extent uh, to what extent the phenomena is uh, widespread and to what extent the phenomena is uh, a persistent and to what extent the phenomena actually create different uh, representation of international migration so on the one hand we need to know what this representation may uh, create and this representation is yeah we, we should be concerned about this issue of representation on the other hand we, we we want to show this representation 
So for this, for example, we needed to go to the individual level data sources, European Value Survey, European Social Survey, different data sources, and be able to reconstruct this category, yeah, to have individuals and to know their history in terms of in, in representative fair random samples and to know when they arrived to each country and in what year and from what countries they arrived. And only knowing this, we could, from the beginning, to see what proportion of people who are called international migrant by a World Bank indicator, Eurostat, European Union actually indeed crossed international borders and what percentage didn't cross international borders. We need to start with this. We want to see if it happened only in 2008 or also in 2018. I mean, if the, if the phenomena persistent and for this we need statistics. And then we can talk about what made this phenomena persistent. But if we do not see the persistence of the phenomena and the using of the category, we cannot even, you know, kind of uh, come near to answer the question why it's persistent. Yeah, and what interest it serves and what it, and, and what interest it's prioritized. This is how I would take it uh, in a, would you help me? Yeah, no, I think that's that's true. That um, so um, um, we sort of the 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 mixing of methods or the mixing of 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 uh, theoretical epistemological traditions are coming at the level of of literally like reconstructing the nature of those categories, right? So how they are constructed. Um, what are the social lives of these categories, how they travel from one context to another. Um, you can even hear, I think, in our in our respective descriptions that we talk in sort of, we talk different languages, right? So so uh, Sasi is talking about representations and I'm talking about the social life of the categories and how they're translated and travel. So that's that's the that's the mixing in our case. That's the interdisciplinarity, right? So when I learned to uh, when I learned to understand her um, language, and when she learns to understand mine, and then we sort of um, um, after a lot of debate and a lot of sort of <laughs> back and forth and disagreement, yeah, we 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 come to. Um, to something about um, and and also and the, the example of uh, of uh, persistence that Anastasia gave uh, in, as one of her examples. So how would you how would you account for the fact that despite the fact that um, uh, the statisticians and uh, population experts they actually do know that the problem exists. It's not that, that they are oblivious, right? But they keep using the category. They keep using the category and they keep producing um, a lot of reports um, using this category. And then you, you have a, a, an asterisk there saying, you know, and sometimes this category can be a little tricky and it can produce um, um, sort of, it can skew the results and everything, but they keep using it. And so we were, we were interested in the, in, in this paradox. So how would you um, account for that? And I think the triangulation that we've done with sort of more interpretive a understanding of textual representations of migration of of the of post-socialist Europe in general, right? So the the post-socialist Europe as the other of Europe, uh, the the sort of the, the legacy of the Cold War and all these things that that sort of, that was partly my contribution, but also Anastasia. It's not like she she has written a lot about post-Soviet uh, uh, Eastern Europe. Um, uh, but sort of bringing, triangulating these different sources is that I think that when we come um, together. Oh, that what produces um, uh, something that cannot have been produced otherwise. Yeah, that's, that's my answer. I, I think that, you know, there, there's something very, very funny that, you know, trying to make the tables clearer, but not, not having the asterisks that you are talking about, Ina by clarifying the categories you know that may be a very a very a very valuable uh, product of your research right 
well, not having, uh, I mean, not having these asterisks and complicating and, you know, making it, uh, can, can we really compare between these, these two persons that are, are classified as migrant or not? I mean, I think that that, that would be very, very, very useful. Um, and uh, especially in our days that, well, not with Corona, but let's see what happens afterwards. Uh, uh, and what what would be the uptake of, of the of the numbers of of worldwide migration, which are you know growing in, at a very at a very impressive way uh, in the last uh, the last couple of decades. Uh, yeah, I find your presentation very significant. I have to say, <laughs> in this in this context, you can use it. You cannot. <laughs> <in reverse. laughs> um, Especially, it uh, highlights the amount of effort we put in this identity of ourselves as qualitative researcher. It really opened my eyes uh, to notice how much energy I put in identifying myself as non-quantified qu quantitative researcher. And I wonder if part of it is that qualitative research is still less acceptable in academia. And I, so I find the need to, you know, to answer. Um, oh, it happened the same way on both, on both camps. I don't know. But it's, it really opened my eyes to notice how much effort I put in actually not listening to the other side. As you say. Thank you so yeah. much. Yeah, so I was as a graduate student, I was part of uh, of an um, um, interdisciplinary program. It was called uh, Population Studies and Training Center, and it was a, a center that tried to sort of uh, um, involve graduate students from sociology, anthropology, economics, demography, public health, um, and. Uh, well, it was successful to a varying degree, so it wasn't always successful, but um, I did pick up a few things there, right? Sort of how to, you know, there, there were a lot of rolling of eyes involved in that process, of course, and, you know, listening to economists or even like different um, uh, disciplinary conventions when people talk, right? Sort of uh, when anthropologists are talking, they're reading their papers, they usually don't use PowerPoints. They're reading their papers. They don't want to be interrupted in the middle. Um, and then there were economists who that if you don't interrupt, something is wrong with you. Um, and then um, people would sort of, inter you know, economists would interrupt anthropologists and anthropologists would get mad at them and, you know, all, the, all these things. But I did, I did, I, I, I realized it later on that I did, pick up a few things how to uh, how, how to listen to, to to the other how to sort of not to be intimidated or threatened by by, by the others um, uh, disciplines which which was we was which was an interesting experience so I think uh, I think it can be done it can be actually um, it can produce interesting results that's what I'm trying to say yeah. You know, I think my students suffer now from uh, my experience in this project but that, because in my method <laughs> class, every time I try to define paradigm, I'm teaching fundamentals of social science research, first year students. So every time I try to define the paradigm and to, to explain them, the, the second sentence, guys, I'm exaggerating now. Just to explain you what it is, I'm taking, I'm taking it to the, to the extremes. Yeah, but, but this is extremes, and extremes are always reducting. So please, I'm exaggerating now. So they, they really you know, <laughs> suffer from it. But on the other hand, I do believe that we are much more, uh, like when we do good research, we are much deeper, careful, and uh, each perspective know how to deal with certain uh, uh, criticism that other paradigm just throw on it by itself. No, yeah, like, like we know, and this is also was in review, you know, like one of the reviewer asked, it was from my, but when you, uh, 
it was when you uh, use a survey, uh, people um, people report they give their answer based on their based on their uh, memory. Yeah, I mean, and you can put them a category. Yeah, we know that they. They, they give answers based on their memory. Yes, it is subjective and it's retrospective. It's not like we do not know it when we use survey. Yeah, I mean, again, I'm exaggerating, but this is like one of the questions in the review process, like how you can uh, 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 rely on survey because it's retrospective, retrospective, yeah? And we do ask open question in what country you were born. Yeah, we do not say, we do not give them the names of the country sometimes, but in this case, no. So it, I mean, I, I do believe we should more rely on each other that, like because we do not know what other doing and how, mm -hmm dealing with the with the criticism mm -hmm, mm -hmm. i think there is a question yes yes but i also noticed the time oh we yeah are running late. <laughs> so uh, thank you so much again it was fascinating really interesting mm -hmm. thank you thank you thank for you very us. much thank you thank you very much